in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into a brand new episode of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money Smith and Money. This episode is all about the people. We got a ton of questions to, to recap okay. this this draft by the LA Chargers. I thought it was a very solid draft. You and I talked about Quentin Johnston. Didn't get a chance to catch up on everybody else. So uh, I'll start with you. Just your overarching thoughts on on what the Chargers did after Quentin Johnson rounds two through seven. Yeah, I thought you know it, it was an interesting draft. The the way it broke. There's a bit of a run on receivers in the third round. Uh, I think they probably might have dipped in, you know, with one of them there, you know, versus Darius in in the in the fourth. Um, clearly, they were interested in getting more explosive. You know, we talked about the returner and kind of how they would attack that. So the fact they get Davis in the fourth, yeah, a lot of it, it's what's interesting, you know, is when you have some of the the draft pundits and they're like, oh, that's a little too rich, and it's it's well, they're going to use him as a returner. He was arguably the most explosive returner you know, in, in college football last year. So that certainly changes the calculus on, is he a receiver? Is he a returner? Is he a returner that can then, you know, be a featured player in the the jet sweeps and a lot of that eye candy that we always talk about that gives so many teams trouble. You know, the Andy Reid and Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan use a lot. So he's going to be a nice weapon on on that front. Love the two defensive picks in, in the second and third. You know, yep. Tui Pelotu, we, we talked about him repeatedly. I think when you go and you watch Henley, there's a lot – of Drew Tranquil there, you know, someone that is, you know, a, a safety, an athlete that became a linebacker that really, you know, had, when you look at his total number of snaps versus what his production was, uh, an incredibly productive player. And then, you know, McFadden, who very much like Jamari Sawyer, you know, can play one through probably, you know, could play both guard, both tackle positions as kind of that swing that maybe you were looking for with Hymas, and, and now his clock is ticking a little bit, so you get someone like McFadden in there. Um, Matlock, I think, fits, fits the the high, kind of that high character profile, you know, someone that was the captain yeah. of a Boise State team that dominated their conference and, and certainly had a lot of explosive plays on his ledger against some high-level competition, too. You know, Fresno State had a really good game against Hayner and, and Fresno State. Um, you know, the Duggan pick I thought was curious. I just was like, wow, that's interesting, you know, to, to take another quarterback when you feel really good about that room with Easton and, and Herbert. But then you heard what Tom had to say that, yeah, they, they want to have an extra quarterback in, in camp, maybe even four. So, um, so yeah, overall, I thought it was solid. I think your, your drafts are always graded on your first round pick, you know, first and foremost. And most importantly, you have to hit on your firsts. And I think Tom in his career has done a really good job at hitting on the firsts. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple misses in there, but that's going to be the case. You're always going to have misses. You know, half the guys make it, half of them don't. But the fact that he's connected on so many, I think, has, has, has been a testament to sort of what he sees. So I think going back to what we talked about with Quentin and, and kind of how he's going to turn out uh, is probably going to be how you're going to grade this draft. Um, yeah. no, no doubt about it. Everybody's happy. All 32 teams are happy right now. They thought they did an excellent job, right? They, they, they think that their team uh, has improved markedly, and it's the jury's going to be out on, on all these guys, frankly. Yeah. I love what they did defensively, though, Money. You know, we, we talked about the need for um, finding that next young edge player, and, and they, they stay home for it. And, you know, Thule, if you've watched him play, man, yeah. he's unbelievable. His motor doesn't stop. And, and when you look at Joey and Khalil and their age and the fact that they've missed games, he's going to see a lot of playing time his rookie season. So I, I was really excited about that pick. Henley was another guy. He hadn't played linebacker. He, he's, I think he's been playing the position since 2020. So he's, he's, right. he started on offense in high school. I mean, this guy is, like, like you said, he's just a freak athlete. And, you know, what I loved about him is just – that infectious enthusiasm to, to want to, he wants to be great. You know, I, I, I saw the, the FaceTime with him and Derwin and it's it, it just, he just seems like a guy that, you know, you know, Derwin's going to take him under his wing and I wouldn't be surprised if he's, he kind of gets into, into the rotation a little bit, obviously Kendricks and Murray are the linebackers as we speak today, but 
Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see a lot of Henley um, the the first his first year. And you know, Jack Campbell was the linebacker that the Lions took. Look at Dane Brugler's like uh, top list. I think Henley's right next to him. So it's really in the eye of the beholder in terms of okay, Henley went in the third round. Jack Campbell went in the first round. But it's all about fit. It's all about what a team thinks of you. So, you know, there, there yeah. was so much made about Jameer Gibbs and going at 12, but you know, we, we didn't put together. They didn't want Swift on the team anymore, and they thought that Gibbs was the missing piece offensively. So you can't knock teams for picking players where they pick them if they fit your system. Certainly. Look, I think, you know, a lot there. You hit on a lot of great points. Um, one, and I was kind of looking off screen because I was digging it up because I wanted to make sure I had it right because it is weird when you think about the COVID year and and all the transfer portals. You know, Henley is a transfer. You know, Tupelotu is, is a rare player <laughs> because he is 20 years old. He did not – he's not a transfer portal guy. 20 – he is a – That's you crazy. Know, in terms of the NFL, he is a – much like Isaiah Spiller last year, this is a young ascending player. So to be able to get him, he's going to turn 21 right before the season starts. You know, contrast that with Henley, who's 23 right now because of the transfer portal, because of the COVID year and all that. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, when you're talking about, you know, Tug Pelotu and some people that, you know, they want to point out, well, you know, a lot of that production was in this one, it, it, whatever. The guy's got a high motor. He's got long levers. He can play inside out. You can kick Joey inside and have him outside on a lot of those pass rushing downs. And I think that's a great point. You know, we saw with with Chris Rump in the hopes of his development that maybe it's just not quite there yet. You know, it's still not quite there. So you gotta just keep fill you gotta continue to build those lines. And I think that's something with that second round pick. Now had one of those tight ends slipped, I think they would have taken him. I, I think had had Laporta slipped I I think you know had Mayer slipped I I think you absolutely would have seen them taken one of those guys because I know he was at you know Musgrave Tom was asked about that afterwards he just said look that's just the way the board works and I think that's where you, you you do believe best player available you know and and I think the first round's a little bit different because again you really want to hit on those first round picks so that's that's where maybe things get a little bit different but as you look at the second defense you know pass rusher as you get to the third linebacker special team like Henley is going to be I don't know how much he's going to play on defense with the signing of Kendricks you know and I just think we're going to see a lot of that sort of one linebacker dime you know Derwin and that's if things go great if JT Woods can get on the field with Aloe Gilman, and Derwin can almost be that second linebacker. I'm not sure how much we're going to see Henley, but I think he can be a force on special teams. And we saw how important special teams was last year, and I think that's a big reason why Davis ends up getting drafted uh, in the fourth. The one thing I, I found kind of interesting was, you know, all these players from TCU, the, the three players from TCU, when, when you look at rosters, the Big 12 has really kind of been down. Uh, in terms of of just sort of where they are in the context of the SEC and the Big Ten. And even when you look at the Chargers roster, right, you're talking about Kenneth Murray, JT Woods, and, well, I guess Dickert, but he's, you know, it's the kicker from Texas. Oh, Eamon is from Oklahoma State. It's not a big twelve. A lot of Big Twelve guys out there. So the fact that what they did you make a first three? What 12. did you make a three TCU guys going? Really on the same unit? You know, it's it's just interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and I think that's something that that you know we talked about last week. That that I'm just you know I'm I'm oh, I, I again I'm fighting my own bias. Like I'm not a Big Twelve guy. Like it, it that that conference scares me. It just does. They're so, you know, I work with. Uh, with with Petros on the radio and he calls college football games and he told me a funny story he was doing I might have even told it on the podcast before because it cracks me up but he was doing a Texas uh, well I shouldn't even say the teams right so he's doing a big 12 game and the guy says to him the defensive coordinator in the production meeting Petros all I gotta do is get two stops that's it and we'll win the game <laughs> and I can't get them like that's <laughs> That's how bad defense is in the Big 12. And when you look at, you know, when you look at corners, safeties, there's none 
There are none. There were three corners drafted this year out of the Big 12, one in the second, uh, Brents from Kansas State, and then I think two in the seventh. You know, you had one safety drafted out of the Big – two safeties drafted out of the Big 12, both yeah. in the seventh round. There's no so DBU like, in the Big 12. No. Like, there, there is nothing. So that's where, you know, I just get a little bit scared. It's like, yeah, TCU had a great run, and they played really good football. But, man, hey, no defense being played in, in the Big 12. So, you know, it's just kind of funny how it works out. And I think that's what's sort of interesting, right, about the two receivers they took is you've got Quentin Johnston, who is going to be measured against Zay Flowers and Jordan Addison. No doubt about it. They were oh, taken, yeah. you know, and Jackson Smith and the Jigba, who was taken right before him. That Those be four story. receivers will be graded against one another their entire careers. Who got it right? They're not all going to make it. They're just, they're, they're not. The, 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 that, that's, that, I hope they do. I hope every single one of them has a successful career and those young men make a ton of money and have great careers. I would love to see that happen. I'd say it ain't going to happen. So yeah. they're going to be judged. Front offices are going to be judged on which one they decided to take. Same thing. The interesting thing is with, with Darius Davis too, right? Is he kind of got picked in this little, this little window with Charlie Jones out of Purdue and Tyler Scott out of Cincinnati. And, and you know, it's different because it's fourth rounders. And like you said, you know, teams are looking for something different, right? You know, like, oh yeah, well, yes, we, we took him, but he's a better returner than Charlie Jones. Yeah, I know Charlie Jones has all these targets and all this incredible production at Purdue, but he's not half the returner that Darius Davis is. So it's, it's funny when you unpack it that way. Yeah, it's it's all you know. And I thought you brought up a great point with Jameer Gibbs. People attacking the Lions for taking him. I know for a fact there were two other teams in the top twenty that would have taken him. I wouldn't be surprised if the Chargers would have taken him at twenty one. He was very, he was highly regarded in this draft. So there were reports that that people had a higher grade on him than Bijan and you could you know that's those were the right. reports I don't know what's true but but yeah. obviously the the Lions felt comfortable moving out of six not taking Bijan and getting some, some that's capital. the interesting part of all that it's like you know? man you're uh, that's you, you could have taken it you're taking a running back and you could have had beach like that's the one where I'm like yeah I just can't agree saw, with you there you know, but man buddy, I saw a little bit of Brad Holmes's uh press conference and he he said Bijan is a bell cow we needed something a little bit different so I, that makes I no guess, sense yeah well that makes I, no sense to me why would we want a bell cow when we can get someone who's not <laughs> reliable for trying to circle that, that square the, on? the only thing I could think of is okay they uh they got David Montgomery and Gibbs is a perfect compliment to him I don't know whatever yeah give me Bijan all day that's the one part that I just don't understand yeah but, anyway but, but again look you said it, like the Campbell thing, the Campbell thing, like he's just a total Dan Campbell player. Like the, those two, they, they, it's, it's coincidence they got the same last name because my goodness, they, they, they are exactly the same guy. And that's like, you know, sometimes that's sort of what you, what you like the whole, um, like the whole Will Anderson thing. You know, it's not just the, the on-field production. You know, D'Amico Ryans is trying to change everything in the Texans organization, change the culture. So, like, that's – I now have my leader of the offense. I now have my leader of the defense. Let's create some culture, set a foundation, and build from there. And so, you know, yeah, yeah we're not here to, to judge. Congratulations to Gibbs. Stoked for him and, yeah. and all those guys. You know, just to keep going on that, just the, the fifth thing, you know, Washington last year took Jahan Dotson, and everyone was like, why, why did they take Jahan Dotson over some of these other wide receivers that were on the board? Dotson had a pretty good rookie year. They took yeah. Emmanuel Forbes this year because they needed ball production. They needed pick sixes. They needed somebody to make plays on the football. Um, when there were a lot of other corners that I think were highly rated on most people's boards outside the NFL, certainly yeah. with mock drafts. So, again, it's in the eye of the beholder. We're not going to be able to judge these draft classes for a number of years. Um, but we do have a lot of no, questions. The, the fans will. They'll, 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 they'll judge it right away, Chris. They're already judging it. <laughs> oh, yeah. They are judging it. And we'll, we'll get to a couple of questions. Yeah. You know, this is like kind of a two-for-one. Uh, this is from Chris. Uh, who does the team view as starter at deep slash free safety? And Bolts 9-4 with two roster spots left. What post-draft additions do you expect or hope to see? And money, I, I'll, I'll kind of like tee this up for you. Obviously, they, they want JT Woods to take that step. Right now, it's, it's Derwin James and Alohi Gilman. Um, but if JT Woods can, can be the player that I think they envision him being when they drafted him in the third round, you'd want him to be the, the deep 
free safety, right? Uh, no doubt. John Johnson is another guy that we hear about, um, and I know that there's maybe a couple of spots left that the Chargers can pursue. Maybe he's an option as well. Certainly. You know, and that's where I think coach, you know, coaches versus front office comes into play. You know, it's how much money do we have? Um, I kind of gave you all these guys you wanted last year, and it's going to be very hard to do that this year because of sort of, you know, the big swings that you took last year. So it'll all come down to what does John Johnson want? Yeah, JT Woods is who they'd like to see there. Obviously, without Nas and that not working out a second round pick, you hate to see that. And, you, you know, you wish him well as he's already, you know, out of the NFL and decided that he doesn't want to do this anymore. So they hope it's JT Woods. It's a very tough position. We talked about this. You hope having a year to figure it out. You brought up the great point of it took Mikey Davis a year to settle in and all of a sudden was exceptional last year, his second yeah. year in Brandon Staley's when, you know, there were a lot of shot. Not I shouldn't say shots being fired, but a lot of concerns about Mikey. Like, yeah, there's a re- he's just really struggling to, to figure this out. Uh, he played one way. This is a different way to play. So you hope that's the case with JT. That's what they like. They would like to have a Lowy and JT, you know, on the field. So like we talked about at the start of the pod, Derwin can be that queen on the chessboard. Um, if they don't – and look, I think for, for John Johnson, for all those players that are still out there, it's just going to come down to money. You know, how, what, what, obviously Morgan Fox is back because he took a pretty low money deal. You know, it took, a, it took a very affordable deal for the Chargers that he was content with. So I think that's probably going to come into play again with all of these veterans that are out there that are going to probably start getting signed here in the next week or two. I got an uh, Instagram question earlier this month about just kind of talking about the future of the team in different holes and not only looking at 2023, but beyond from Steven. So that's kind of be, going to be the theme of a lot of these questions, Steven. We appreciate that question. This one comes from Connor. How many snaps does a starting tight end play compared to a third string wide receiver? And do either of you think Quinton beats out Keenan or Mike for the starting job? First of all, no, that's not going to happen. Keenan and Mike are going to be the starters. Um, right. And, you know, Quentin, this is this is very interesting because the, the, tight, the whole thing with the tight end role and should they have taken a tight end over Quentin Johnson, if you're looking in the short term, Gerald Everett's going to be that tight end, right? And, you know, I think it's more about Quentin – and Joshua Palmer. We're getting a lot of Joshua Palmer questions. Did, did right. we forget about Joshua? He had 78 catches. He had some some big games in the absence of Keenan and Mike last year, or Keenan specifically. Yeah, our, um, our game. Yeah, I, I I look at the stats last year, Money, and I, I think this. I, I think that Quentin is going to play a big role this year. I think Joshua Palmer is as well. And I think the role that Austin Eckler played last year is going to be a little bit different. He's not going to catch 106 balls this year. He's not going to catch a bunch of checkdowns. I think Kellen Moore is going to change this offense to where they're going more vertical with these guys. I don't know if it's going to be Quentin Johnson with more production than Palmer or vice versa, or if Everett's going to see more shine, more one-on-ones. Um, if, if Mike or Keenan goes down with an injury, if, if one of those guys steps in. But I think the one thing that we're kind of overlooking is how many balls Austin caught and how many of them were checkdowns. I think his yards per reception was like 6.7, right? So I, I think Kellen Moore wants to change that. Uh, kind of a long answer, and I'll let you kind of pick it up yeah. in terms of third string wide receiver. I think wide receiver three is really what he means yeah. versus a starting tight end. Yeah, start there just for people that want to nitpick. We know what he means. He means, yeah. uh, you know, a wide receiver three. And, you know, pretty much it's 11 personnel most of the time in the NFL now. You've got three wide receivers out there. So don't think of it as a third wide receiver. But in three receiver sets, is he going to be the guy ahead of Josh Palmer or Jalen Guyton? He's going to have to fight for that spot. Um, you have to look at it beyond one year. You know, you look at the restructuring they did on the contracts and the contract that Mike signed last offseason, and there's the potential that he's going to replace one of them as an affordable replacement. So that's that's part of it, the tight end part of the question. So that's interesting, right? Is it is he more valuable? Would you, are you going to get more value out of Quinton Johnston over the, let's just even say six years, because if he's really good and you can't figure out an extension, you can franchise him for a single year after the fifth year option and you're totally fine. So are you going to get more out of Quentin for six years than you would Dalton Kincaid or Michael Mayer, if that would have been your selection? I think that's a legitimate question. 
You know, and I think it's a question of where's offense going in the NFL? What is Justin Herbert most comfortable with? What is the need? You know, what are your needs as a football team? And I think something to remember, and it's something that we've talked about repeatedly, is that explosive element. And so many people are pointing out after the draft, you know, of, of, of Johnston and why it, you know, when you start to really dig into it, why maybe it makes more sense is the, the yak, the explosiveness on those short, you know, in-cutting routes, you know, just sort of the quick pitch and catch, and he's able to go. Um, and you see a lot of those in his highlight reels. Again, I think it's important to, to keep it in context and say, okay, what was the competition he was doing it against? But you, you look in the playoffs, he had that huge catch and run against Michigan where he was just on a shallow crosser, caught it, and bang, there's that speed, and he's gone, and it's a touchdown. And so the, the Chargers were one of the worst yak teams in the league last year. So there's some of that. That's kind of where I came in on Zay Flowers and thought he was the perfect guy. It's like, hey, dude, this dude is like Jalen Waddle, explosive. You're going to get those short routes, catch and go, and that's what this team needs. Yeah. And I think they saw that in Quentin. And the reason, you know, that maybe he won out over Zay is because he then presents that big target downfield. We know Herbert is really good with big receivers. Um, and so I think that's kind of where that comes into play. You know, and, and then the other part of that, too, was it Scott that asked the question about the tight? I think that's who you said. Was that his name? Uh, it was it was Connor. 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 Sorry. And then the other thing, Connor, is is financial is over over the six years. You know, like, look, Dalton Schultz was great with the Cowboys last year. Right. He just signed a one year deal. A very affordable one year. What was it? Twelve million bucks. I think 11, 10 million bucks, something like that with the Texans. So let's just say you're going to move on from Gerald Everett next year or you're going to, and, and now here's Dalton Kincaid taking his place as your tight end number one. Okay. Well, let's just say the way the contracts are structured and I hope it's not the case, but you move on from Keenan or Mike, what's it going to cost you to replace them? If you didn't draft Quentin Johnston, you know, yeah. you drafted Dalton Kincaid. Well, now you can't afford these two guys anymore because you kicked the can down the road to get Herbert's extension done what is it going to cost you? And is that player that's even going point. to be available to you? So that's – all of that stuff comes into play. You know, a yeah. lot of it is financial, positional demand, uh, you know, in the league and, and how that all sort of fits into your puzzle of what you have on the roster currently. You know, I don't think – you know, I, I would be very surprised if, if Johnston had – as good of it, I don't think he's going to have as big of a season as Zay Flowers. I think Zay's going to have a huge season for the Ravens just because of how he fits and what they have on the roster. You know, Rashad Bateman, they're still waiting for him to raise his hand. Odell, we don't know, you know, what kind of year is he going to have. So I think when you look at their room versus the Chargers' room, I've got Mike Williams, we've got Keenan Allen. You mentioned Josh Palmer when pressed into action at 100 yard season. We know the chemistry that he has with Jalen Guyton. I think this is more of a long-term play. Like, we know he's rough around the edges. We know we got to fix some things. But we it, believe – It's, it, it's an excellent point, man. Excellent point on, on the wide receiver because, listen, it, it's – the elephant in the room is, is the cap number of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams next year. Yeah. Keenan Allen turned 31 on draft day. So, of course, you want Quentin Johnson to come in here and, and make a huge impact. Those guys are going to be the starters, but this is when we talk about the draft and looking towards the future. Right. 2024 is going to look different in that wide receiver room. Joshua Palmer is going to be a part of it. Um, Quentin Johnson is going to be a part of it. I would think Mike or Keenan is going to be a, a part of it, um, but it's going to be very hard to pay both of those guys when you look at their cap number in 2024. I mean, look at what DJ's comp was for Quentin Johnston. It's Mike Williams. You yeah, know, what after we the talk catch. About with Josh, yeah, we talked about Josh Palmer that he's trying to emulate Keenan Allen. I mean, just put two and two together. Exactly. You know, that's that's what they're hopeful of is that Josh Palmer can be Keenan Allen and that Quentin Johnson can be Mike Williams. And now you save yourself forty million dollars in wide receiver salaries next year. All right, buddy. Let me lay this one up for you. It's from uh, old podcast producer Cole Weinstein. Uh, seems to me that uh, a lot of these players will be backup rotational roles as rookies. Which players have the best chance to make a big impact either after earning that starting role or in a rotational role? So any of those seven guys, I think I, I take Max Duggan out of the equation, but uh, yeah. what do you think? 
<laughs> we, we better. <laughs> well, one, we, we know how important DeAndre Carter was last year, right? We talked about it with, with Tom and with, with Coach repeatedly. Every time the guy touched the ball on a punt return, he got your first down. So Darius Davis is going to be your starting punt returner, you know, and, and he's a guy that took how many in his college career? I think five. Five returns to the house, I think, over in, and kick and punt returns yeah, to the so. house. So he's going to have a chance to have a serious impact. Like if if I were to guess, he'd be my number one because he's I know, got the locked in role of, of anybody yeah, right now. He's, he's going to be your kick and your punt returner. So and if if the defense with Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa and Derwin James and J.C. Jackson and you know all these guys is as good as we think it can be, you're going to be forcing some punts. And as good as Ryan Ficken was in his first year, and as good as DeAndre Carter was. You know, well, then Davis is going to have an opportunity to impact a game. You know, maybe just uh, even if it's just on a single punt return, as tight as these, as small as these margins are and as tight as these contests are, he's going to have a chance to make a real impact. Um, the other, I, my number, I, I guess if we're talking about non special teams, my number one would be Tui Pelotu because they need him to be. You know, that, 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 is, a, that is a role that is available, that is ready. You know, because Kyle Van Noy is no longer on the roster as it stands right now. I hope he comes back. I'm sure they're trying to figure out a way to get him back. You know, unless, of course, they can get a low-money deal for Leonard Floyd or, you know, Yannick Ngakwe or one of those other edge rushers that's out there. But as it stands right now, where the roster is right now, I think Tui Pelotu would, would be the guy. I would even circle ahead of Quentin Johnston, I think, just because of of the lack of depth, of the injury concerns at that position and, and what they're hoping to get out of him. Stay on uh, Darius Davis. This is from John Hills. Uh, do you foresee Davis having an impact with the offense this season, or will his contribution be limited to special teams? Is there a Davis comp Kellen Moore has worked with in Dallas? I mean, it's a loaded wide receiver room now, money, right? Like, you know, when we go into training camp, we're like, okay, well, you know, there's a big battle there. No, it's a, there's a log jam there, right? If Jalen Guyton comes right. back, he's young enough to, to I, I think – be ready to go uh, after that ACL injury in September. I mean, you have that speed. I think to your point about the gadget plays, maybe you, you move Davis into some of those gadget play situations, but he's he's not a big guy. So I, I think it's going to take uh, – it may take an injury or two for him to, to see the, the offensive side of the ball uh, on a consistent basis. Yeah, I'm going to go back. I'm just going to go back a few years because obviously since they had Schultz, they kind of became – tight end heavy so if I go back to 19 it's Gallup Cooper and Cobb nobody really there um, if I go to 20 it's let's see Cooper Gallup CeeDee Lamb so no not not really but you know that's the great thing about I thought Kellen Moore made a great point you know in his presser you know on with his media availability the other day he's like you know, for people asking you know well, well Kellen Moore needs tight ends he's like well no I don't it's just what we had He's like, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable working with what we have. When they had, you know, the, the two tight ends, they worked with the two tight ends. When they had, you know, Gallup, Cooper, and, and CD, it was a ton of 11 personnel, you know, yeah. and he worked with those split backs a lot too, you know, with, with 21 personnel when he had both Pollard and Zeke in the backfield. So that's the great thing about Kellen Moore as your OC is adaptability. Is exactly. Like that's what you always want from your – the last thing you want is a coach that thinks his scheme is so special that the player that displays traits that would excel in a different situation are forced into that scheme. Players, not plays. That is what this league is and, and has been forever. So you think you've got it all figured out and that your scheme is what wins? No, it doesn't. It's players. Find a way to put your players in positions to perform. And Kellen has shown an incredible ability to do that. So the great thing about Davis, just to answer the questions, I took a long circuitous path, which I typically do. Sorry. Well, it's a podcast, He's going to be funny. active. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. He's going to be active. Every, every game day, he's going to be active. So because he's your returner, which makes it – which is great because now if you feel like, you know what? I think maybe uh, maybe we can get the defense flat-footed here. Let's throw Darius out there, and let's let's run a, let's run a reverse. Let's run a jet sweep. Let's run you know halfback option. Let's. There's so many things you can do. The second he steps on the field, his speed is it's it's different level. It's cartoon speed. There's a couple highlights you can go to YouTube. 
you know, people listening, if you haven't dug into it, look up Darius Davis highlights and you will see what we're talking about. When he turns, the, I think it's the Kansas game. He turns the corner and it's just like the, the defensive backs are stuck in mud and he's on fast forward. So when you have that and you're, and, and there's no question, Kellen's going to do that. He's going to put that on film just so teams have to prepare for it. So every so when you put him on the field for two or five snaps, whatever it may be, it's not going to be a lot. Not not when you have this kind of not when you have Johnston, Palmer, Keenan, and Mike. Like Darius Davis is not going to be out there a lot. It's yeah. going to be those moments, and it's going to be one of those things that you got to think about. It's the it's, it's it, Miko Hardman factor. Every time yeah. he stepped on the field, you're like, all right, what are they doing with him? So even though he wasn't very productive. Exactly. If he's on the field, you have to account for him at least, you know, um, Gerald Everett too, Donald Parham. Yeah. I mean, these are all these pass catchers that the chargers have right now. Um, this is from uh, our buddy, Dan. Uh, hey fellas of all the drafted players or UDFAs by the chargers, which do you feel is most underrated by fans and or pundits? You know, money, I, I was going to say uh, Jordan McFadden here because of his positional versatility and just going back, because it's so recent in our minds, what Jamari Sawyer had to do um, in, in Rashawn Slater's absence. Now, knock on wood, you don't, you don't want any injuries to this offensive line. But the fact that you are continuing to build the O-line with a guy who has a number of starts under his belt at tackle and is probably projected to be a guard at the, at the NFL level. But I think a guy like that, uh, who has experience in college, a number of starts, um, you add him to an offensive line room with Corey Lindsley and Rashawn Slater and guys who have done it, Zion Johnson, who who did it last year, and can and Jamari Sawyer, so two young guys. Uh, so I would I would say McFadden. We talk about all the skill position guys, but uh, you know I, I think it's going to be important, and you've preached this too. Continue to build the offensive line as you as we get closer to this Justin Herbert extension. It's great. It probably would have been my first choice. I think you, you hit it on the head just because we saw Trey go down, fought through some injuries. We know he can play right tackle, left tackle. We know he, he, he's built a little bit more like a guard. We've seen that athleticism and those second-level blocks from him. So I think, that's, I think that's probably the right answer just because guys get hurt. And to have someone that can play each ta- you know, right-left tackle, right-left guard, you know, if everything works out, it's huge, huge to have that available to you and we saw it last year with Jamari Sawyer and the fact that he's going to kick inside to guard and you know what don't be surprised there's a little bit of competition there you know maybe maybe there is competition between McFadden and Sawyer for that right guard spot he's a big dude and he's an athletic guy and you saw some of those second level blocks that he was that he was doing when he was at Clemson because you know with with DJ Uyangalele back there you know and a running quarterback you saw him have to hold blocks for a little while get downfield when he when DJ tucked it clean out some second level guys he was able to do that all right guys quick break as the official hospitality provider of the nfl on location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier nfl events like never before on location brings you up close for all the action providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to super bowl sunday and everything in between on location thrilled to announce its new partnership with the pro football hall of fame this August kickoff football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL also headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On location, official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end-to-end planning, and much more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location. I'll go Scott Matlock just to continue the conversation. The defensive tackle, sixth round. Watching him is a lot of fun because, his, one, he's violent. He's a big dude. He's got heavy hands. He stacks and sheds, and he's making plays in the run game, just kind of keeping his eye on those gaps and figuring out which way he's going to jump. His motor's ridiculous. He's chasing quarterbacks down. You know, when they're reversing field, even though he's 310 pounds. And you've got Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack on the outside. So you know you're going to have opportunities on the inside. We saw that with Morgan Fox, career high sacks. We saw that when Tito started to flash. You know, so we know Fajoko had a great back end of the year. So I think that's something that, that, that Tom Telesco and Coach Staley, you know, certainly thought about 
that you know we do pretty good with these defensive tackles. You know, whether it was Foster Merrill that we put in there, like all of these guys were able to eat. Well, let's get the captain of the Mountain West champs and the guy that was the straw that stirred the drink on defense for the Broncos and put him out here with all this talent around him and and see what we got. So he's a lot of fun to watch and, you know, was able to produce sacks, pressures, tip balls, block kicks, a couple touchdowns, you know, as a tackle eligible. So, or I think he was playing tight end in a couple of those games. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch him. So that's one that I think maybe – especially because of the injuries, right? Austin Johnson, Tito Abonia, he's someone who very well could have a couple opportunities out there. That's a great one. Great question, Dan. Um, Dude, I thought we were buzzing through these questions. We have so many. I appreciate you guys. All right, uh, I'll I'll keep it shorter. I'll keep it shorter. No, no, no. All right, this is is like an off-the-beaten path one. I like this one. This is from Jake Cochran. Uh, In Aussie Rules Football, we have a father-son rule, which gives clubs priority selection of a player whose father played 100-plus games for the team. Could the NFL draft use a rule like this to continue seeing family ties as Porter Jr. with the Steelers? So that well, means- at our age, at our age, Chris, it's going to start coming into play, right? Like we're going yeah. to start seeing a lot of these. Uh, we're starting Gunner, to see a lot Gunner of these Rivers. legacy. Gunner Rivers is going to be exactly. charged. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, like Ladanian's nephew got drafted, the the corner out of TCU in the seventh round. So we're we're starting to get there. Where at, at our age, we're starting to see a lot of these uh, young men, <clears throat> these legacies, pop back into the league. So it's interesting. I kind of like it. Um, <clears throat> but I think, you know, the NFL would put the onus on the teams. Hey, you want them? You're going to probably have to draft them around early and celebrate the heck out of them. You know, very cool moment <clears throat> in Dallas, arguably the, the best moment of the draft. Oh, to yeah, see Deuce awesome. Vaughn get drafted, you know, and his dad call him, say, how about you drive me to work tomorrow? Very, very cool moment. Yeah, everybody everybody was a little emotional in that war room during that moment. Uh, yeah. Still, okay, here, let's see. Uh, no running back drafted or signed through free agency. Is the plan to run it back with the same three running backs? Eckler, still waiting for someone to step up. LT and Turner had sprawls for a few seasons as a group. They lacked dominance last year and couldn't close games out. Okay, there was another one about Spiller. What do we know about Spiller? Um, I, I think we could just kind of combine those questions because it, it looks like they're going to roll with these guys. And Austin, I think Tom said that nobody called about Austin over the weekend. Yeah. So you got Joshua Kelly, you got Isaiah Spiller, and you got Austin Eckler. And we don't know much That's about it. Spiller, but we know that he was really good in the SEC and he didn't get a lot of run next year or last year. So hopefully this year, Kellen Moore can work with these three guys. It seems like they're comfortable. Yeah. And as I'm going into the uh, thing again, Isaiah Spiller uh, will turn 22. Uh, on August 9th so yeah, go, it's very young very young last year I like we, we've talked about it before would have liked to have seen him get all the carries in that Bronco game in week 18 just to get an idea but he you could see it in his face you could see it in the in his body he's a big guy 6'1 215 but not a man's body right and we saw that transformation of Joshua Kelly from year to year and I guess I don't know if you've seen him yet, Chris. I have not. I haven't been out to the facility. But uh, that's what I'm hoping to see, that physical transformation of dominant in college to, you know, an NFL body. And now, you know, now that you're on an NFL program, NFL nutrition program, NFL workout program, granted Texas A&M probably has the most money of any program in the entire, you know, Division One college football world and it's all available to him but you're talking about a guy that was you know a kid was 18 19 and then just turned 20 years old so I think that's something I'm looking forward to because he was a really good back in college and I think maybe they just felt like he was not quite ready for the rigors of the NFL last season and you know Austin was having a good year and Joshua Kelly was having a good year so they they had what they felt like was a good running back room but my guess is that's their hope you know, and, and look, hope is, is great to have. It's got to turn into production, but they're hoping that JT Woods, their third round pick, and Isaiah Spiller, their fourth round pick, are ready to take that jump here in year two. Isaiah was the youngest player drafted last year. Yeah. Right? So, yes. 20, 22 years old. Uh, do you agree with draft analysts like Emery Hunt who say Quentin Johnson will fit well as a slot guy with Keenan and Mike Money? This is from William. So Quentin in the slot? Yeah, Quinn in the slot. I think he – I mean, he's played both. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing, right, is a lot of people thought 
because of his size at 5'9", that unless Zay Flowers is going to be the next Steve Smith at that size, to, to have the sort of physicality to be able to play, you know, the, you know, the X or the Z, then he's just going to be exclusively in the slot. And that's where Keenan does most of his damage. So I think that's one of the reasons why Johnston maybe was the guy is versatility. The fact that you can put him outside, you can run him in the slot. You know, those, again, those, those over routes on the inside, those three by ones, you know, where he can just get that quick hitter and, and the yak production was, was such a TCU that, that, that gets people excited. So, yeah, I think you're going to see him. You're going to see him in the slot. You're going to see him outside because that, you know, the, both of those, both of those spots, you know, sort of fit with his skill set. So to, to answer the question, he's not an exclusive slot, which some guys sort of are. He's yeah. not. He, he can, we, we saw that. We, we've seen him. The guy's got a 40 inch vertical and he's six foot three. You know, so, yeah, throw him outside and give him some 50-50 balls and let him go up and get him. Uh, Boris the Bolt, do you feel comfortable with the depth? We currently have the offensive line. We kind of just talked about that. Um, I think it's getting better and better. Uh, Our guy, Jay Paul, what are your thoughts on carrying three quarterbacks? Is it possible Easton or Max could be going by the final roster? Thanks for the always enjoyable content. I don't know. Would you you be comfortable with a seventh-round pick as the backup quarterback or or – Easton, or would you want all three in that room? It's a great question. <clears throat> I think, you know, they've shown they like carrying three. You know, the question is if you, well, if wonder, you put – Well, you know what? Joe Joe maybe showed that he liked carrying three. Maybe maybe right. Kellen thinks different. I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I do think having that extra position on a game day, um, yeah. or or obviously two are going to be active, but, um, but having that extra position on the 53 I think could be beneficial. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, it'll come down to whether or not they think Max gets plucked off the practice squad. If he's a developmental guy and they want to save a million bucks, you know, or a million and a half dollars next year with, with Easton no longer being the backup, if Max can ingratiate himself with, with, with Justin and, and that's your quarterback room, then, then that may be what they're looking at. You, you know, you're always you're living on the margins. You know, it may sound like a, a small number when you're talking about 200 million plus as your salary cap, but it all helps. And if you can get rid of a vet for a rookie contract for four years, that's what you're always trying to do. Now that Easton has graduated from his rookie deal to his veteran deal and, and took about a million and a half dollar jump uh, in order to be the backup. Boltville, uh, what do we do at safety if we're not able to get John Johnson? Who starts? Does Q start over Palmer? And how's Money's throwing arm doing? Is he going to quote <laughs> Herbert and say his shoulder is about 75% healed? <laughs> Shoulder's fine. How was the shoulder? It was, it was, you needed a week though, fine. right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fine. The next day, it was that, that morning, it was sore when I woke up. It's fine now, though, thankfully. <laughs> Bounce back. Um, we answered so. I just wanted to get that last one in. So oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Gil, but, uh, I think Gilman's – ultimately, it's going to be Gilman and Derwin are your starting safeties. You yeah. know, you'll have – Kendricks and Kenneth is your starting linebackers and you'll run nickel and they'll, you know, you still got to figure out who that third corner is. I think ultimately they'd probably, if all things being equal, it'd be JC Mikey. And then in, you know, your, your slot corner, your, I should say your nickel corner is, is Asante is what I'm guessing. Bryce Callahan. You think Bryce Callahan will come back? I mean, why yeah. not? Right. I think the injury yeah. stuff was a little disconcerting. The fact that he got banged up there throughout the course of the year, but he's still out there. You know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of dudes out there. Marcus Peters is out there. Um, Rocky Seen is out there. Like, there's still corners out there. So, whether or not they, they're comfortable with that. But, yeah, I think you go into – let me just kind of get a look here at the – I think ultimately that's what they would want, right? JT and Mikey on the outside. Asante at nickel. And, you know, your depth is Jasir. Dean Leonard from your draft picks last year. You know, Jasir can play. Maybe they're hoping that Jasir takes another step and he can play that nickel position with Asante on the outside with Mikey and then JC comes back. So that's what I'm guessing they're trying to do. But up top, yeah. I mean, uh, Aloe is, the is is I think, slotted as the high safety with Derwin as the box. Eden, why not bring Callahan back? We just talked about that. Let's see. Uh, Brandon, a lot of Chargers draft media talked about getting players in the draft with high floors 
and low ceilings. Do you think the draft was balanced in that aspect? High floors, low. Well, I I would disagree with that. I I think Quentin is a is a home run swing. Um, I think that's definitely. I think your high floor would have been Zay or Jordan Addison. You know, I think those are more of your high floors, not quite as high of yeah. a ceiling. Johnston, you're you're projecting. Hey, this guy's pretty raw, but he can be something really special, and we'll take the risk. I think Henley's um, like a high ceiling guy too. He he's played the yeah. position for two years, man. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Same with Darius Davis, right? That's you're 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 spending a fourth round pick on a returner. I mean, that's that's a home run swing. It's like, yeah, we're you know fourths are those are starters. Those are guys you're hoping can end up as starters. So I think to to take a a, a, a kick returner, punt returner in the fourth is is a pretty big swing. So you know, but then at the same time, yeah, Matt Locke, McFadden, those are high floor guys. You know, they they probably are what they are, and you like the way they fit with what you do. So yeah, I'm not so sure if it was, if I would call it high floor. Um, just because Tui Pelotu so young. So, and, and I think, you know, like you said, Henley's just uh, transferred from Nevada and, you know, really kind of took off with, with Washington state. Like you said, yeah. just kind of getting settled in. So yeah, I would think it's more, I would think there were more bigger swings than safe picks. This is from John Bingham. Uh, how much influence do coordinators have with determining a selection? I think the front office has the final say, but I, I guarantee you, uh, Kellen Moore was uh, asked his opinion of Quentin Johnson. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this: like, if I were to, if I were to answer, if I were to give you an honest answer, I would say very little, just because, you know. You've got a, a scouting department. These guys are watching these players for 365 days a year. You know, the coordinators are coaching. They're coaching the guys they got. They're watching film of their opponents for tendencies. Like, that's their job. Their job is to coach the players that they're given. Now, it's possible before the draft that they flip Kellen Moore. Hey, can you just kind of give us your the, – here's the problem with asking guys – to weigh, it's a very delicate balance, right? You don't want them to feel like they're not part of the process, but if you involve them too much and say, hey, which guy do you like, and they give you someone that you don't take, well, then they feel like, well, what the hell did you ask me for? Yeah. So it's, it's mostly scouts. It's scouts, and it's, you know, and it's Kevin, and it's JoJo, and it's Tom, and those are the guys that are making, that make up 90%, and John Spanos, that make up 90% of these decisions. Yes. The other 10% is Brandon Staley and his staff. Metaverse hero. This is, I love this question because everyone's just looking ahead to 2024 now. Have you guys watched tape on Brock Bowers? Is he the number one priority next year for the Chargers? So, so well, we're, we're, we're talking, we're talking. I, tight sure end. Shall, I hope not. My God, they'll have to have one of the five, probably five worst records in the league. If they're going to get their hands on him. I mean, Brock yeah, Bowers is on the top 10. So yeah. let's hope. No. I, I, I would yeah. hope they have absolutely zero chance of getting their hands on him. Yeah. It's, it's very, and that's the funny very, thing, like, about Darnell, like, you know, speaking of Bowers, you know, about Washington, and everyone like, why is he – what is going on? Why are the Chargers not taking Washington? Well, clearly there was medical. Yeah, there was medical, you know, there's, yeah. There was a medical, so that's, that's why, you know, those things happen. But, yeah, Brock Bowers is just going to be like a Kyle Pitts selection. He's going to end up getting taken in, in the top probably seven, eight picks. Um, final one, and we kind of covered this, but uh, Jared Robertson, do you feel like Josh Palmer is being undervalued by the fans and media? I keep hearing Allen Williams Johnson, and it's bugging me. Palmer had a couple huge games when he was our wide receiver one last year. Go back specifically to that Atlanta game where where he basically huge. helped. He won the game for the, for yeah, the Charles huge. Uh, throughout the throughout the thing. I think it's just you're, you're getting you're stacking Justin Herbert with weapons, and he's going to find the open guy, right? Like. That's pretty much why they got Quentin Johnson. Keep getting weapons yeah. for Justin Herbert. Yeah, I think I, I don't. I, I think it's a fair question. You know, I think it's just wide receivers. We've talked about it. That they, they are all cut from a different cloth. So, what is Josh Palmer compared to? What is Quentin Johnston? They're different. You know, Josh does not have the same sort of speed or acceleration or athleticism that Quentin does. 
Josh is a much better route runner than Johnston. Josh has much better hands than Johnston. But he doesn't have that extra gear after the catch. He doesn't have that top-end speed to take the top off a defense. So it's nothing against Josh. It's just they need those things. You know, they need the threat that this guy's going to catch the ball and take it to the house. You know, if your defense, if your defense is misaligned and he gets a, a quick slant, he's got the potential to go to the house. If you single cover him on the outside because you're shading safety help toward Mike, then he's got the potential to beat the corner, win a jump ball, and take it to the house. So that's it's nothing against Josh. It's just a different – he's a different type of receiver. So I don't think it's a slide on, on Palmer at all. All right, Money, I think we got through most of the questions. You know, I, I feel like the last few months we've been living in this what if Austin Eckler is not a charger. It, it's very – Possible. Who knows? Maybe he does get traded, but I'm going to assume he is a charger, right? Going into the 2023 season. And, and I think we should just try to move forward as if Austin is going to be on this team. And we haven't really talked about his fit in Kellen Moore's system. And we have broken down all these wide receivers and the tight ends on this team. I'm wondering how Kellen is going to use Austin and how different it's going to be from how Joe Lombardi used Austin. And I, I kind of alluded to it with, with the amount of catches he had. I don't think he's going to have 106 catches this year, but I, I'm wondering what positions Kellen Moore is going to put Austin in when he has all these other weapons on the outside. I think it's going to be fascinating. Well, one thing we know about Austin is he's incredibly strong. You know, he, he, he is and has the ability to run between the tackles and he sheds first contact. He's got great vision. So again, I, I, I think Whatever system Kellen wants to run, however he wants to use Eckler, we know how much he likes to run the ball, how balanced he wants to be. And I would suspect that you're going to see him use Austin like he used Zeke and like he used Tony Pollard. I think Austin's plenty strong enough, very good at absorbing contact, shaking it off and getting yards after contact. You know, he's a smaller back, so you want to protect him. You know, you don't want him to take too many hits and and wear down. I think if you were to ask Kellen, like, best case, it's, yeah, I, I've got a rotation, just like he had in Dallas, where he can split it 50-50, be it Josh, be it Isaiah Spiller, you know, and I think you'll see, like you saw in Dallas, two guys, two, you know, some 22, some 21, where you've got two backs out there. And Austin, you know, starts in the backfield, motions out into the slot, maybe goes wide of the numbers, you know, forces a linebacker out in coverage where he's really got an advantage. So, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Um, but I have full faith that Austin can do anything that Kellen Moore would ask of any of the backs he had in Dallas. There's, I just cannot, for the life of me, envision him being traded now. It would have had to have happened before the draft. You know, yeah. you, you, Getting 2024 draft capital for a guy that had the most touchdowns in the NFL the last two seasons by 14 or 12 or whatever it was, that's not happening. He's, he's going to be a charger, and you hope they can figure something out so he's not disgruntled and sits out all of training camp and isn't able to go and learn, you know, and, and get, you know, adapted to this new offense because it's a new coordinator, new verbiage, new new style of running, this wide zone, you know, new style of running. Like, they need him there. So they got hopefully they can – both sides can figure something out to make this workable this season and, and maybe even a, another season or two beyond. Yeah, the, it's the business of football, and, and I get it. But I think for Austin, yeah. it's frankly, it's in Austin's best interest to get in and learn this system and have the best year he could possibly have so he can go into free agency next year, right, and yeah. and get what he feels he deserves, right? He'll yeah. have another another crack at it after this year. And with all these weapons that we talked about throughout the, the last 60 minutes – I mean, he's going to have some opportunities to do similar things, and he may not have to have the stats that he had last year to be as effective. It's all about winning, too, right? Like, he, they they need to have a winning program here, and if they win a playoff game or two and Austin has a good year, I tell you what, that probably means more to teams than just stats, you know? Stats are stats. I hope so. You know, it's unfortunately Austin, I think, recognizes the state of the NFL. And he, he recognizes, you know, I need, I need to get my money. 
you know, I, I've got to be able to get my money because the reality of me getting it after next year, probably, I've got to sign that deal before I turn 30. You know, it's bad enough past the age of 28 when you're a running back. But, you know, when you're talking about when you're talking about Austin as a running back, he is I just want to make sure I got it right. He is. So he'll be 28. He's actually oh, that's funny. He's born on the same date as my wife. Uh, he'll be 28 in a week. So he wants to get that deal before he gets on the other side of 28, 29. Yeah. You know, that's why, like I said, I hope there's a way that they can figure this out, give him a year or something like that. But who knows? Yeah. You know, his first two years in the league, too. I mean, you just you look at the production, it's it's increasingly yeah, going up. Um, but but in terms of carries, it's not like he's he's never close to like 250. 300 i mean his you know he, he does so much in the past game too but just looking at that's I, the thing I still it's think not carries it's touches yeah it's the touches um, you know with the receptions you're talking right about here. what 204 carries. so it's 311 touches it's a lot yeah that's that's, uh, a lot that's a lot so i can understand guy wants his money 311 yeah. touches at 27 man help me out here yep all right, dude. Well, All that right. was a fun little uh, little recap of the draft. As always, guys, you guys make the show go. Uh, appreciate the support and uh, all the questions. Uh, we love doing that. I like doing doing that like once a month, man. Just sure. Get, no, it's great. Fans. And uh, um, now, I guess we'll, we'll continue to dive into the draft. But we got the schedule release coming up. We could dive into the games, the matchups, yeah, money. I know that. Uh, that's week from tomorrow fun. is uh, schedule release. Yeah, week from so tomorrow. We'll probably do this probably have to do this maybe a day later next week make maybe sure we get that Friday. sweet charger video whatever they're going to do this year we'll react to that yeah that's and, right and uh, it will circle yeah let's do that friday i think i think friday would be good for that yeah. or we'll double up whatever we'll figure it out we'll figure it out we got a lot to talk about so all right guys appreciate you listening right. for money i'm chris this has been chargers weekly as the official hospitality provider of the NFL, On Location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier NFL events like never before. On Location brings you up close for all the action, providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to Super Bowl Sunday and everything in between. On Location, thrilled to announce its new partnership with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This August, kick off football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the Class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL also headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On location, official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end-to-end -end planning, and much more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location.